I'm Nicholas Borners of Capital Inc. and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Today's webinar is on the topic of the new energy landscapes, especially following the Ukraine crisis. This is part of the Capital Link Master Webinar Series, and we are privileged to have with us Fred Bendel. Fred is the Chairman and CFO of uh, Inatech. Fred, uh, given his positioning in the industry, has unique uh, insight on what is happening today. So Fred, I'd like to welcome you. And uh, I'd like to start uh, our uh, Q&A, our discussion with the following uh, remark. I don't remember who uh, was the um, European uh, leader who said that uh, Putin's war on the Ukraine was the kick that uh, the world needed for, for a geopolitical awakening. And clearly, uh, I think with what is happening today, we see a completely new landscape uh, in energy, both for the short term and for the long term. So let's start if you don't mind, what do we see for the short term? And then I'll ask you another question later on, what do you see the implications for the longer term? And obviously that uh, applies on oil and gas trading for the whole energy chain. So welcome and I'm looking forward to your... Uh... Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. We're delighted to be here and to be able to contribute something. Um, well, well let, me, let me start rather than talking about you know, as you say, long-term effects or structural changes, which I'm sure there will be. Let's just talk in the near term about yes. its effect on the markets. Exactly. So what we saw in the market was a spike in prices, kind of fairly predictable, um, when the war broke out. Um, and that's based upon the volatility and I think uncertainty about where that war was gonna go, whether there was gonna be an escalation of that war. But the spike was very short-lived. And very quickly, it returned to its pre-breakout of war levels, which were admittedly already high. But those high prices were something that had come in from about mid, um, mid, 20, mid 2020, no, mid 21, mid 21, those prices came in. And we saw those big increases in gas and oil prices in May, June last year, and long before the war started. So I think, the immediate consequences was a short term spike and a quick return back to, let's say, high normal levels. Um, and I think that's a sign of the resilience in the market to these geopolitical changes. That is great. Now, so you make a very good point that uh, we see the spike, they are event driven. And then when the market kind of absorbs the situation, prices go back to a more normal. However, I think right now we do have uh, we do have, I think, uh, a disruption in terms of the supply. Or am I right or am I wrong? Um, we we don't we, we don't have a disruption in supply at the moment. I mean, that's the interesting thing. Um, there's been some voluntary. Uh, uh, some voluntary um, prohibitions, if you like, by the US and the UK particularly on buying you, um, product from Russia. But most of the rest of uh, Europe are very dependent and they have not said that they are not going to buy it. And the convenience of the mutual arrangement between Russia, who needs the dollars, and the West, who needs the energy, has meant there hasn't been much of a disruption in supply. There's been expressed goals about, about weaning Europe off and weaning its dependence on Russian products, but none of that has actually happened. Very interesting point. So if I understand correctly, the sanctions right now do not apply on energy. And therefore, the disruption in terms of energy has been minimal. Uh, of course, we have disruption on, on a lot of other areas. We have disruption in shipping, in, in, in a lot of other imports and exports. But is it correct to say that uh, on the energy side, uh, most of the energy is exempt from the sanctions? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, hydrocarbons are exempt from the sanctions. Um, the sanctions <coughs> are, are not secondary sanctions in the way that there were sanctions on Iran that prevented transactions happening. 
So buyers are free to buy and are still enforcing. We've seen this as little as recently as today, still enforcing their contracts with Gazprom and with um, Russian oil companies. Um, we've seen this dispute about currency and, and the Europeans are saying, no, no, we're enforcing the contract. There's no clause in the contract that says you can, uh, you can force us to change the currency to rubles. We're enforcing the contract as is, you will supply, we will lift and we will pay in dollars. And so, yeah, there's been no real disruption and it doesn't suit anybody for there to be a disruption at the moment. Politically, as politically, politically distasteful as that, as that may be, that's the fact. It's an interesting, I mean, it's an interesting object lesson for us, the degree to which the European political leaders are prepared to stand up for a principle if it causes a degree of pain to their own people, you know, economically. You bring a very interesting point up. And uh, on one hand, as we were discussing offline before, you have the ethical uh, concept. Uh, but on the other hand, and again, I will go to my opening statement, if you don't take a stand now to reduce your dependence on Russian oil and gas for the long term, then you perpetuate the risk. So I think, uh, based on what I read, uh, it seems that the trend towards gradually disengaging from Russian oil and gas is kind of unstoppable. And I think in the longer term, it might take time, but in the longer term, I think it might create a very different energy landscape. Am I right? I'm sorry, I have to disagree with you again. I think I think it will make some changes in the landscape, but they're changes that are happening anyway. I mean, Russia will continue to sell its oil. The West may wean itself off oil and gas from Russia. Russia will find buyers in India and China. I've seen the infrastructure in China waiting to receive uh, Chinese, waiting to receive Russian oil into China, and it is vast and the Chinese want the energy, they're sort of short of energy. So it will just go east and we will find alternative sources of energy for the West that are uh, less, that are from, I think Putin's term, less unfriendly states than Russia. So there will be a structural change in supply chains. They will shift around a little, but the world will continue as it did before. We will buy oil and we're already in talks with them from Venezuela and from Iran and uh, states that this time three years ago were pariah states that we could never deal with again and they've become the lesser enemy now and we will continue to buy from them in order to wean ourselves off oil from this enemy and that's I think you know that's just the way the world works and will continue to work where political and economic expediency will at a certain level override uh, ethical and political necessity. So you, you have uh, oil on one hand, you have uh, gas on the other hand. Uh, the US announced, I mean, you, you're, you're right that the UK and the US are less dependent compared to the rest of Europe. Uh, but we just heard about uh, the US government uh, making a commitment to ship a lot more LNG to Europe. Uh, there will be floating storage facilities built and so on. Don't you think that over time that will create a new landscape? Yeah, I, I agree, it will. But, you know, oil is, a, oil is a fungible commodity. And the idea of there being oil independence is something of, of an illusion. Uh, oil is a, is a commodity and it goes to the person who will pay the highest price for it. So... Um, if uh, or, or you will buy from the cheapest supplier. So, you know, there will be a move for a period into, as you mentioned, LNG cargoes, for example, coming from Qatar or the US into Europe. And a lot of infrastructure will be built to support that. And gasification and degasification is extremely expensive to, to build. So that will take some time and it will, uh, it will be reflected in the price of that energy. And when the day comes that there is a cheaper source of energy that is by then politically acceptable, then there will be cheaper sources of energy, including from the Eastern Bloc, will move back into Europe. It, it's a commodity and the, policy, the politics of the world changes. 
By the way, if you, if I can digress a little bit, uh, given all this desire now, which has accelerated to uh, lessen dependence on uh, fossil fuels, uh, there has been a decarbonization drive already now that can be potentially accelerated. So uh, do you see that, uh, you know, uh, the focus on renewables and uh, other green sources will intensify and help lessen dependence on uh, fossil fuels? Would that be material or? Uh... Yeah, it, it will intensify. And, and, and I think you have to separate out their non-carbon based sources of energy and carbon based sources of energy or, you know, fuel carbon based fuels. So I think you'll see an acceleration clearly of both as we try to wean ourselves off, not just carbon, uh, not just uh, Russian en uh, carbon energy, but all carbon energy, for sure. There'll be something of an acceleration. Whilst that has been, there's some prospect of there being, you know, uh, clean energy in Europe. For example, we know the UK produces about 40% of its electricity through wind and, and solar. You know, you have to remember that's really quite a small part of the world and the vast majority of the world is still going to produce its power from carbon-based energy. Uh, in India, it's almost exclusively coal. In China, it's almost exclusively coal. You know, it's a, we're, we're looking from a privileged position at a tiny portion of the world that can afford to be clean and environmental, and most of the world can't. So when we talk about a transition away from carbon and fossil fuels, I think we're looking at it through the telescope of a privileged Western elite, and we're forgetting about the rest of the world. And that transition is going to be very long time coming in the rest of the world. So, Fred, if you, uh, if I can ask you two questions, uh, one is, if I'm an end user of energy, and I come to you, who do you suggest that I do in today's environment? Uh, are you a, are you a retail user or are you a trader buying? <laughs> well, well, the first thing I suggest you do is get is get Inatex product tech oil. So you can manage your risk and your <laughs> and buy your physical and your physical purchasing process, but. If you're an end user of energy, I think from, you know, as a social responsibility, you should buy the cleanest energy that's available to you. And personally, I'm prepared to pay a higher price for that energy, but not everybody can afford to. So I look at it from one position, which is quite privileged. And I accept that many people can't afford to do that. And of course, the big, the big argument that the developing world makes is, well, hang on a minute, look at your carbon footprint over the last hundred years in Western Europe and America, and we, we, we've got a long way to go to catch up with your carbon footprint. So you can't penalize us and stop us uh, using carbon fuels. And, and frankly, you know, whilst that will destroy the planet, there is a moral issue to be dealt with there. So if I turn the table now and uh, I ask, instead of being the, the user of energy, I'm the provider of energy. Uh, our discussion today is about perspectives of leadership in a volatile industry. So what do you think uh, the energy providers, uh, the oil majors and so on, should be doing uh, in today's environment and with the eye for the longer term? Well, there's, there's, no, there's no doubt that leadership is about being out front, okay, taking risk and, and setting the you know, setting the, 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 the route and not following. So what leaders today should be doing is deciding the, what their goals are and leading from the front and accepting that there are risks in that because, there were, because the way forward is completely unclear at the moment. You know, it's very difficult to say which is going to be the emerging energy, which is going to be the, the fuel of choice in the future, but you've got to bet on something. You know, so I think it, it's the job of leaders to do that um, and and to inspire those below them to follow along that route. And some of them will get it wrong and some of them will get it right. Well, uh, we deal a lot, as we you know, with uh, shipping companies. So we just had uh, uh, a, a major event and everybody exactly is discussing about from the shipping end about the fuels of the future and what this will be. And uh, it's not yet clear, as you mentioned, who the winner will be. 
many pathways leading to a greener future, but you don't know exactly which pathway to take. But given this, uh, how are the big trading houses transforming their business in today's environment and also in relation to the decarbonization drive? Well, I, I can speak for Glencore, uh, not speak on behalf of Glencore, but I can speak from my knowledge about Glencore. That's a good one. I, don't, I can't speak from my, not any knowledge about the other traders. They are, as you know, somewhat uh, retentive about data. So, you know, I know Glencore is making great. We got a new generation of leadership in Glencore um, and the new generation have a different view of the world and a different way of doing business. And they are definitely driving forward a green, environmentally responsible um, uh, agenda that takes into account community uh, governance, environment, and all these other issues that are so important nowadays. So from Glencore, I know, you know, Glencore is setting up a power desk um, to, to trade electricity. For a long time, Glencore's had a gas desk trading gas, which is a clean transition alternative to oil. But that's not to say that it isn't still trading oil. And in fact, many people will have seen this in the press that Glencore bought up many coal interests uh, that other companies were divesting. And in fact, it's interesting to note that many of those other companies uh, who were driven by fund managers to sell those investments or in that, you know, investors, the fund managers that were investing in those companies who, who, who sold their coal interests are now saying, mm, actually, maybe we were a bit premature in selling those coal interests because the world still has a need for responsibly operated assets which produce carbon-based fuels. And we were perhaps in a better position to responsibly handle those than, you know, some of the small operators that they sold to who are less environmentally conscious and less safety conscious. So I think I think that just reinforces the idea that this trans transition is a long transition, not a short one. And and it's going to be a mixture of traditional fuels and new fuels. But you've got to make a start somewhere. And the start that I see the trading houses is making is investing in some of the new cleaner energies. And we see in Initech our clients doing the same thing. Our clients moving into renewable fuels, uh, the biofuels, LPG, LNG, sorry, and, um, and, and into electricity. And they're looking for the tools to do that because they know they have to make that transition. That is uh, very interesting. And, and clearly it is a trend uh that will intensify i mean you have all these goals to achieve over time in terms of decarbonization targets but i think clearly the industry today is a lot more um, uh, focused on this if i may conclude with the question that will combine a personal element and a corporate element in today's environment i mean you are leading a major company so uh, how do you see your role as a leader, the, the chairman and CFO, changing in today's environment? And then, if I can go to the corporate side, how do you see the role of the company changing in its positioning in terms of uh, working capital, counterparty risk, uh, exposure to, uh, you know, to trading partners and geopolitical risks? Maybe you can start with the, the personal element first and then transition into the corporate side. Yeah, from from a personal point of view, how do I see my role uh, changing as a leader of the company? Well, I mean, there's there's two there's two ways that it changes really uh, that I'm very conscious of. Um, one, and we're a technology company. Let's be clear, you know, we're not an oil trader. We're a technology company that supports oil traders and and uh, and oil marketers and shipping companies. So I think my role in the business as, as a leader of the business is, as I mentioned earlier, is to look for the new opportunities and look directionally where the world is going and look for those uh, look for those areas that other people haven't thought of because they're too deeply involved in the day to day of execution. And it's not a leader's job to execute. It's a leader's job to look beyond the horizon and see where we're going to be. Now, in, in Inatech, what does that mean? And I can combine my two answers here, I guess. In Inatech, that means I've got to look 
to where I want to take Inatech in the future. And that means where are the market opportunities in the future? So I need to align Inatech's functionality with where the market's going. And that means the new fuels, the power, and also with analytics and you know quants and all these areas that where, where people are now looking to maximize the value of these vast amounts of data that they've collected from their transactions over years. And they want to use that data and they want to use that data in order to make their business more profitable and reduce their risk. And so I've got to take Inatech in that direction. We're already on that journey, but that is where the future is. Now, combining that, as I say, with the fact that there is a younger, well, I'm not dealing with the old school guys that are my sort of age now. The people running our clients are young men and they're from a different generation. And so they are very concerned with issues like environment, which drives them into clean fuels. They're also concerned with governments and community. And they're much more responsible than our generation ever was. You don't do business the, the old school way anymore. So I have to think much more about how we can help them with our products uh, and as a company to do business the way they want to do business in the future. And that is much wider than just technology and data. It is helping them to take that journey and ensure that they run their businesses ethically, environmentally friendly and with responsibility to their, to their communities. Thank you, uh, Fred. This has been very helpful. And uh, I want exactly to mention, to underline that uh, throughout our conversation, you have been quite focused on this decarbonization drive. So this is obvious in terms of where I think we're all going. And that will add, I think, over time to the transformation of the energy landscape. Um, before we conclude, can I ask you for, uh, a final remark in terms of uh, where we are today and uh... there's, there's only there's only one final remark that is kind of relevant today and that is that I see I see slight cause for hope in a resolution of the human tragedy that is taking place in Ukraine. And I hope and pray that Mr. Putin, if he doesn't, you know, if he if if he is still sane, comes to his senses and finds a peaceful resolution to this war that he is engaged in on Ukraine and that people can get back to their normal lives before more human suffering is caused. That's the only thought I have today. Let me second that thought, and I have to say we are all in pain every day reading what is happening, and it's unbelievable that we are in 2022 and we see this human tragedy um, developing at this scale. So uh, it has been a privilege to have you uh, with us. Uh, I had the opportunity to discuss with uh, Frederick uh, Bendel, the chairman and CFO of uh, Inatech. Uh, Fred, thank you very, very much for being with us, and I hope we'll have the chance to continue this discussion in another yeah, way. It's, it's been a pleasure, uh, and I would love to do it again on, a, on another subject in better circumstances. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye.